Hello, and welcome to our webcast today on quality indicators of customized employment. My name is Katherine Inge, and I'm the principal investigator of a research study that we were very fortunate to receive uh, about a year ago from the federal government, and we are working on looking at the quality indicators of customized employment as we actually do research on the topic. And so some of what I'm talking about today is uh, from this project, but also what we've learned over the years about customized employment. So I'd like for you to relax a little bit and travel with me for a few minutes to talk about customized employment, some of which you may already know, so um, that will be great, and some of it may be new, or some of it may be just a new spin on how to look at customized employment. I think if you ask most anybody what customized employment is, you'll hear them say that customized employment is based on the individualized strengths, needs, and interests of the individual with a disability, and that it is designed to meet the needs of business, so that basically it benefits both. And in fact, the first reference to customized employment was in the Federal Register early in 2001, and the Office of Disability Employment Policy uh, first introduced this concept of customized employment. And actually, I think customized employment is the evolution of a, a lot of really wonderful practices that we have done uh, dating back really a number of years. And we might touch briefly on those. If you are doing customized employment, I think uh, you will probably realize that. But if you look at uh, what a practical definition of customized employment might be, because actually, any employment situation where an individual is working uh, in a community business, we would hope that it is meeting the interest and needs of the individual with a disability while serving of a value to the business. We would hope we could define almost any service that way that we provide as far as employment services. So let's think of really some practical uh, aspects of customized employment, and these really should look familiar to you as well. And that is that the person is making at least minimum wage. And when I say comparable wages, I mean that if the individual is doing job duties that someone else is being paid greater than minimum wage to do, then we should expect our individual who is uh, the uh, employee to receive those same wages or a comparable wage to the other employees of that business. The person is an employee of a community business. That's very important as well. The job description that the individual is doing did not exist before the job was negotiated and that obviously the duties or tasks that the business needs to be done um, that actually match the needs, interest, and support needs of the individual that we are assisting in finding an employment. Well, yes, we all probably will agree with that, but then there's some very, I think, specific things around this that I'd like to talk about to make sure that we are implementing uh, these things with quality. So um, really, I think the first thing that I need to touch on is that customized employment is not labor market uh, driven. Now, I think that most of you um, might say, well, how is someone going to get a job if uh, the labor market doesn't need for it to be done? And so I'm going to let you jump down to the second major bullet on this slide where I say that customized employment is not just a negotiated job description so that I can give you an example of what I mean by saying that customized employment is not uh, labor market driven. So for instance, uh, recently I asked uh, an employment specialist to give me an example of customized employment. And the employment specialist said, well, a new business had, or a new restaurant, I believe it was, had opened up in town. And so they had gone to the restaurant and uh, negotiated the job duty of rolling silverware. Well, obviously that is a job that is of value to that restaurant and that needs to be done. 
But the problem with that particular example, when I asked was, well, who at your agency were you representing when you went out to negotiate those job duties? And that was where the problem really uh, arose or the whole idea of customized employment fell down because essentially they were negotiating job duties. Again, that job didn't exist before they went out and, and negotiated the position, but they weren't representing a person at the agency that specifically had an interest in food service or hospitality or working in a restaurant. They were going to say, okay, I've done customized employment. Now who at my agency would like to go and do this job? So it's really important for us to remember uh, that uh, we don't put the cart before the horse, so to speak, if we wanted to use a, a, a funny analogy, in that we want to make sure that our job duties are negotiated based on the needs, strengths, and interests of the specific job seeker, and that we're not just going out in the community and negotiating uh, what we're calling customized employment jobs. Uh, actually, we are customizing a job, but we're not basing it on the strengths and needs of a specific job seeker. Um, so I, I don't like to spend a lot of time talking about some of the practices that we shouldn't do, but often it's important to really hear some of these ideas because uh, that's what people think things are. So I think it's it's really important uh, to think about that. And I'll only touch briefly on the fact that uh, customized employment is a wonderful strategy uh, to use because people with disabilities have so often been excluded uh, from the workplace based on some of those barriers that I have listed uh, on, uh, on my slide here, the online job applications, personality uh, test, uh, difficulty completing all of the essential uh, existing um, uh, essential job uh, functions that is in a job description. So those are all reasons that people uh, with disabilities have been excluded from the, the labor market, and, and we all know that, but uh, I just wanted to touch briefly on that. So if we think about it for just a second, and I'm going to um, go more into some other ideas about uh, quality indicators, but some of the practices associated with customized employment, I think that you uh, would be uh, really uh, uh, familiar with. These are practices um, that we really came, uh, came up with as we did focus groups with practitioners who were implementing uh, customized employment. And I said came up with, and that's probably an inappropriate way of phrasing that, but we did focus groups where we interviewed uh, practitioners, we interviewed national experts in customized employment, and asked them to describe to us what the practices are associated with customized employment. And then we searched for themes in our uh, interviews. We did uh, many interviews. This uh, work was done on the RRTC on employment for people with physical disabilities. And these are some of the things that people told us that were associated with customized employment. And you will recognize most all of these, that we spend time with the person in his or her typical environment. So we observe that person. We interview family and friends. We conduct informational interviews. Uh, we uh, assist the person in, in observing jobs of his or her choice. We uh, do some brief work experiences. We try to observe the person doing job-related tasks. And we mindfully listen uh, to the individual. And I think that is probably uh, probably the most important thing on the list there, that we mindfully listen to the person who is looking for employment, that we don't make decisions for that individual, that we are a representative, that we are a guide to assisting the person. And that is really, really critical. And the other really critical component is the whole choice component, making sure that individuals have choice. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention all the many uh, wonderful things that have been done in, in the way of person-centered planning, and that we should not forget that foundation as we are working with people to identify their choices uh, for employment. 
When I first started uh, thought, thinking about this uh, presentation, and really over the past couple of years, as we have worked on uh, the research study on the ROTC on customized employment, it's become more and more obvious to me that a lot of the practices um, that we are using in customized employment have their foundation in qualitative research. Uh, and some of you who are practitioners who are out working in the field, uh, working with people directly might say, well, what do I really need to know about qualitative uh, research? Well, I think it's really important because knowledge about qualitative research really can ground us in what we are doing um, in customized employment. And so really, if you look at these things, um, first we talk about doing in the field research when we are doing qualitative research. And that's essentially what we are doing with customized employment. We are participating with the individual in the community in their natural settings. And we want to know how people perform and interact in those settings. And actually, the things that are on my slide uh, here are all directly from the qualitative research uh, literature, but clearly applies to customized employment as well. And the tools for customized employment, as well as the tools for qualitative research, are in-depth interviewing and participant observation. Now, some of you might think, well, we interview people. We've interviewed people for years. We've done that in supported employment. We've done that in all of the different ways that we have provided employment supports to people. We've done participant observation. But I think there's a quality way that we need to look at these, um, these skills and making sure that people that are supporting individuals through customized employment have these skills as far as working with people. Because I think the concept of in-depth interviewing, even though we think we really know what it's all about, uh, we might take our checklist and we go to the person's home or we have them in the, commu uh, in the community agency uh, and we sit with our checklist and we ask them a series of, of questions and we think that we're interviewing the person and we are in a way, but there are some real skills to interviewing um, that I'd like for us to look at um, and think about. So look at that. Uh, we'll look at that in just a second. But the other thing that I uh, thought was rather interesting when I was looking at some of the qualitative research uh, literature, I stumbled across a quote in a qualitative research textbook uh, by Bogdan and Bicklin, who have done a lot of the work in qualitative research, and they compared qualitative research to a funnel where they said that you started at the top of the funnel with all of this information and you process all of this information that you don't have a preconceived idea about where you are going and that the information guides you in your direction. And that is really true of customized employment, that we are we are observing the person, we're doing informational interviewing, we are talking with the individual's friends and family network, uh, we are visiting them in their homes, uh, we are working with employers doing informational interviewing, and we, we start out with a very wide um, scope of information, and then we start looking at that information, and that guides us in the direction that we're going. And that's uh, why I think it's kind of interesting to compare that to a funnel when we're thinking about uh, what we're doing in customized employment. And in fact, if uh, I have heard other people refer to customized employment as, as a funnel as well. I believe I've heard Carrie Griffin use that term. So it's a very good analogy or visualization if you happen to be a visual learner uh, to think about. 
So just a couple more thoughts about qualitative research that we are with people in their everyday lives, that we're trying to have a common uh, sense understanding of what's important to that person. We are gathering lots of descriptive information and we really actually are uh, developing a case study, which is a uh, term very familiar to anyone who's ever done qualitative research. We're developing a case study of this individual. Um, and the, the last term, ecological, really just refers to another, cust uh, really a qualitative, excuse me, qualitative research term, ecological, really looking at where the person is um, in their own little ecological, uh, ecological system. And the first time I ever heard that was really many, many years ago when I first got into this field related to doing ecological inventories uh, with individuals to discover what kinds of skills they needed to learn in order to be successful in uh, everyday lives. And that work was done by Lou Brown. Uh, those of you who are very young may not know who Lou Brown is, but it's a very interesting perspective to look back on some of the information that's really evolved over the, the years. What we want to do is to observe people in their natural environments, learn those skills that they need, and then we help um, them learn those in those natural environments. And that's, that's a really critical concept around customized employment as well. Um, so information that we're going to gather is descriptive. Uh, we might look at people's personal documents. However, uh, we're going to place those in context where they occurred and we're not going to look at them from a deficit pers uh, perspective. That's one thing that I haven't said. I think a, a very important uh, qualitative feature of customized employment is that we are looking at people from their capacities, their interests, uh, their strengths. We're not looking at them um, from, their, from a deficit perspective. That we take field notes, that we take pictures, that we think about um, what people say to us, that we listen to, to what they say, and that we, uh, that we write down people's own words and really look at that. And all of those things are associated with qualitative research, but are certainly best practices in customized employment. Now, I know you've probably heard people say this related to, um, to discovery, and that's a term that I think all of us are familiar with that probably are listening to this webcast today, is the concept of having a purposeful conversation with someone. So a purposeful conversation is really important um, because we are not sitting there with, uh, with a checklist and we're not writing down every word the person says. We might take a note or, or two um, every now and then. I was having a conversation with Carrie Griffin recently or really not too long ago because um, he has been working with us closely excuse me, in the development of this research and is our uh, partner in the research um, customized employment drip study. And he was saying that it's really important when you're having purposeful conversations with people not to sit there and write notes all the time because as soon as you uh, write something down, then the person might think that's really important or that they perceive you as thinking it's important. And so they might go off in a direction in the conversation that they, they would not have gone. So really you're having a conversation with people. You might begin with some small talk. Um, you want to, to have open-ended questions that's guiding your conversation. Um, and I think it's, uh, you know, we've often had, um, we've often asked questions like, uh, well, what do you want to do for a job? Um, and I guess clearly that could be considered an open-ended uh, question or a general question. 
But if you think about some of the people that we're working with employment, they're not going to be able to answer that question because they have very few limited uh, experiences. And that's why we want to go to them um, in their lives and see um, and see where they are and talk about what they do and what did you do last uh, last weekend or what do you enjoy doing? Some of those open ended um questions that really uh, help people think about their lives and what is important in their lives. And I like to think that we as interviewers are, are detectives. We have to look around us. We have to be good observers. We have to uh, really think about what people are saying to us and that we uh, don't evaluate or uh, criticize what they say, that we're trying to be objective listeners. And I think listening uh, is a really important um, skill that we we need to have. And so just quickly, I think a little more on interviewing, some of which I've already said, to ask open-ended questions, try to avoid yes or no questions because you're not going to get uh, much information out of someone. Do you want to work during the week? Yes. Do you want to work on weekends? No. Um, so, you know, you're not really gathering any rich information about that, per that, person's, um, that person's life. Uh, and don't be afraid of silences when silence occurs during an interview. This is a real important sort of quality uh, component to doing an interview in the sense that um, sometimes uh, if we're silent, then the person uh, has time to think and may be able to talk more about things that they really Really, um, that they really need to share with us. So let's talk a little bit about the quality characteristics of, of discovery because I think um, what I see a lot of times uh, now that customized employment has been around for a while is that people uh, know the terms related to customized employment but may not really understand the full implications of what these terms mean. Uh, discovery being one of them, because many people will say, oh yes, of course, um, my agency does discovery. Uh, and what's on this slide uh, really basically is just um, the uh, Webster de de uh, definition of what discovery is. So actually uh, it's not, um, it's not anything that, that I'm going to spend a whole lot of time on. But uh, the other thing that I found interesting as I was looking at some of the qualitative research, discovery is often a, a term that has been used in other fields. It's been used as a legal term. It's been used as um, a term in qualitative research. Again, uh, building on that rich history of research that has been done over the years so that discovery is, is a process of learning things um, that we didn't know before. So one of the most important things I think about discovery that you will um, that you will hear is that discovery should begin in the person's home, and I know that we have often uh, really uh, brought people into our agencies and we have gone through our checklist. And uh, recently I had someone say to me, well, I don't need to go do discovery in the community because uh, this person has been in our uh, in our agency in the workshop for the last uh, 10, 15 years. And we know this person uh, really well. But I think it's critical to remember that people uh, act differently in different environments. You act different in different places. I act different in different places. Uh, so that uh, we may think we know someone very well, but perhaps uh, we do not. So it's very important uh, to observe people in their typical environments, to have conversations with them. And if the person doesn't want us in their home initially, and that's their right and to be respectful of that, then we want to begin in a location of that person's choosing. Those, those are really um, important and key things to begin with uh, discovery. And I know um, also recently I heard someone say, well, my agency doesn't allow us to go into the homes of the people that are in our agency. And I think that uh, if that is your agency, we need to look closely 
at that because one of the richest environments that you are going to observe someone is in their home. It's where usually they are the most comfortable. Um, so I think it's important to, uh, to look closely at this. Another uh, reason that people have said that they don't want to go into people's homes is that they feel it is not safe to do that. Uh, well, I think that no one is asking anyone to do something that is unsafe. Uh, certainly, if you are uncomfortable going into someone's home, you might want to consider doing um, initial activities in pairs. But um, in most instances, I think we know what neighborhoods are safe versus unsafe, and certainly no one is going um, to ask you to do something that is unsafe. But remember, again, the home is probably one of the richest environments that, that, you, will, um, that you will observe the person. I think it's important to remember that customized employment is about establishing relationships. And it's not just about establishing relationships with your job seekers. It's also about establishing relationships among the people that support that individual uh, learning from those people as well as from uh, family members. There are all kinds of networks that we need to tap into when we are doing customized employment, and, that, uh, and that's very critical. And I think um, it's important for us to remember that we need to share things about ourselves as well because people naturally want to know about other people's interests and pastimes. Now, certainly we don't want to share personal things that should not be shared, but in, in having conversations with individuals, you can find common ground, uh, things that you probably uh, want, to, want to talk about. Uh, I think uh, there's a, a very small uh, picture on the slide here. I hope you can see that on uh, your, your computer. Um, I think it's important when we begin working with people to uh, look around their neighborhood, what's in their neighborhood. I remember uh, not too long ago, and this was in, uh, in my own customized employment study, one of the employment specialists said to me that the parents didn't want um, them to come into the individual's home, and so they met at the grocery store. Uh, well, I thought that was kind of an odd place to meet, but that's okay, that's where the person wanted to meet. And I, but then I said, well, did you drive around the person's neighborhood? And uh, this individual said back to me, well, no, because, um, because the mother said that nothing was in the neighborhood and that uh, there wasn't anything to see. Well, I can relate that to my own life because I grew up in a very small community. And if you were to ask me when I was a teenager, I would have said to you that there was nothing in my town. Well, probably within a mile of my house, there was a movie theater, a grocery store, a retail store, there were farms, there were all kinds of things um, that were in very close proximity to my home. But I would have quickly told you at that time that there was nothing there. So it's always important to observe um, and to look for clues. And the, and the reason that I had, um, I just pulled this picture, it was a stock image off the internet it's nobody's home um, but if you look at that um, at that room there are all kinds of clues there that you might think that the person is interested in music well we don't know if that's the the job seeker that's interested in music I remember someone telling me that they went into uh, someone's home or someone's bedroom to look around and there were posters I believe it was either baseball or football uh, and she thought oh boy this is something that's really important to this person and when she probed deeper she found well the mother didn't know how to decorate the room and she thought it would be appropriate to have um, uh, sports figures on the wall so we might discover things um, and we also might learn things that the person isn't really interested in as well, even though on the surface it appears to be. So uh, I think uh, it's important to, um, to really think about that. 
So for those of you uh, who are a little more frilly, uh, I'm probably a little more frilly, so I pulled off another picture to ask us what, uh, what do we see as an example. Um, and this particular uh, room speaks to me primarily because on the wall there, uh, there are all kinds of plates on a wall rack, and if you know anything about older things, you would know that th those are all vintage plates. There's an old uh, tin container on the table with some uh, peonies in that. Somebody must like to, maybe somebody likes to garden, maybe somebody likes to go antiquing. Uh, certainly uh, someone likes to decorate. There are all kinds of things here that we could explore if we happen to go into the person's home and to see, uh, and to see these things. Now on the flip side of that, I'll use an example of someone, uh, I used to go to, um, to an, uh, antique shows, and I used to go to auctions a lot. That was one of my favorite pastimes. And I remember very clearly a mother who always came with her daughter to those activities, and I really had nothing to do with the, uh, with the family, but I remember thinking, wouldn't it be interesting if, um, if that young woman who was obviously very interested in uh, collecting herself could have uh, a job working with an auctioneer, working uh, in an antique store. And, and that's the flip side of really uh, it being very important because I think we're, we may be very good at finding out what our job seekers are interested in, and we may be good detectives in seeing what they're interested in. But on the flip side of that, um, what are those things in the community that would be of value to an employer that would meet the interest of the individual? And using my example of the young woman who had a disability that often I saw on the weekends with her mother at flea market markets, antique shows, and auctions, um, I know that uh, industry fairly well and all of the uh, sort of tasks that surround uh, the auctioneer's um, responsibilities. There's someone, as the auctioneer is auctioning off items, there's a runner that takes the sheets to the desk where people pay that has who, who uh, won the bid for an item, uh, a, a task right there. Someone who's never been in that environment would not know as an example that that was a, a job duty that may be of interest to someone who liked that that kind of industry and may not be able to be at the desk uh, accepting money for payment. So we have to also get very good at seeing uh, what are uh, are, are things that are in the workplace as well as what um, what is in uh, the um, the a person's home. And just real quick, um, I'd like to just make a couple more uh, comments about ha having conversations with people. And this was an example that, uh, that came up recently. Uh, someone said that they were they had gone this was on our research study right now and they'd gone into the home and the mother brought out a box of artwork uh, to show, the employment specialist when they were having a conversation. And, you know, I thought, what a treasure trove that really is, um, because it would tell us so much. These are things that the mother has saved that this young woman has made. Now, uh, we don't know when they were made at this point, uh, so I would probably want to have a conversation about where were they made, when were they made, um, is this person still doing artwork, does she have art supplies here, uh, can you show me some of the th other things that she's done. Uh, so this kind of thing really uh, can set the foundation for good conversation. So you, you might be saying, well, what does that really have to do uh, with customized employment? Well, is this just a hobby? Is this a, uh, something the person likes to do for a hobby? Or is this something that we can explore as a theme for employment. So as we have been doing all of this conversation work uh, with the family, with friends, with the individual, and we start looking at uh, this uh, rich information, this rich data that we have been collecting, 
what themes do we see in all of these conversations um, that are emerging or evolving that we can uh, help the person find uh, an employment situation of his or her choice? So I'm going to just end this conversation about having a conversation <laughs> um, by saying that we need to listen more, talk less, uh, try not to give up on a conversation uh, too soon. Uh, I remember someone saying to me uh, recently, well, the mother didn't have anything to say about that. And, uh, and so they moved on. And I thought, but I could have asked uh, all these other questions that would have given us some really interesting uh, information. So don't don't stop too soon. Uh, ask for clarification and um, really ask people to elaborate uh, their stories because most of the time people really uh, like to tell us um, tell us stories. So uh, I'm kind of beginning. Uh, to wind down a little bit, I have a little bit more that I'd like to share with you today about observing people because we've talked mostly at this point about having conversations with people. But I think it's also very important to remember uh, that what you what you hear may be very different than what you see. People may have a great um, deal more skills than what we think when we listen to them. Um, and I think I've already said that we want to observe people in, in places where they're comfortable. And we also would like to see people in unfamiliar places too and see what their skills are like in those environments. So um, typical places and unfamiliar places are things that we probably want to look at when we are doing observations. Um, one thing that I haven't really addressed um, is that uh, customized employment, good quality customized employment, is learning about uh, it's learning about the individual, but it's not really assessment. Um, we're not, uh, we don't have a checklist again where we're ticking off, can the person do this, can the person do that, um, can the person do this other thing on our checklist. Uh, do they have money skills, can they read, can they, you know, what are their social skills like. We're not, we're not really assessing uh, in, the, in the formal sense of the word assessment. Um, and you may be wondering what 7-Eleven, a picture of 7-Eleven has to do with assessment, but um, we can learn about people's skills in just everyday environments, going back to that word ecological again. Um, so a person may be familiar with 7-Eleven and, and it may not. Uh, recently, I used this example in a training that I was doing and, and I said, um, okay, so let's assume that we have just... Um, observed in um, a workplace that the person has expressed some interest in. So let's go back and use our example of the art. And there's a there's a art studio in town called All Fired Up that does ceramics. And so uh, this particular individual, they had learned about some of their art interest. And so they went and did um, an observation or they actually uh, went and participated in one of the studio uh, sessions at a place called All Fired Up just to see uh, what the person's interest level was in that uh, something that they had learned about in, in the home. And so after the um, the situation, something natural to do might be to stop by 7-Eleven and have um, and to pick up a soda. And so I was doing a training on discovery. So I just tossed this out as, a, as an idea to talk about discovery. And I said, um, okay, everybody's familiar with 7-Eleven. So let's think about all the things that we could learn about someone uh, by going into a 7-Eleven. And I was really surprised by uh, the number of people who gave back to me um, sort of assessment kinds of things that they could learn. Um, and uh, things, things in some respects that looked at the person's deficits as opposed to the person's capacity. And uh, what I mean by that is someone had a long laundry list of all of the challenging behaviors that they might be able to observe if they took it uh, took someone into 7-Eleven. Uh, well, on, on my list, there were things like, uh, well, could the person uh, scan the environment and find the soda machine to, to buy the soda? Because that would be very important for me 
to know in the workplace if they can orient in a workplace. And so going into 7-Eleven, for instance, and seeing their orientation skills might be a really great thing to do. Um, can they use the soda machine? Uh, can they pay for the soda? And I don't necessarily mean, um, do they know what a quarter is, a dollar is, a quarter, see, I'm dating myself now, you certainly can't buy much for a quarter anymore. Um, but can they take out a $5 bill to pay for their soda and expect uh, and wait for change? So I'm not really interested in knowing uh, exactly the can they ha do they have money handling skills because that was what somebody else said well I could look and see if they could perhaps be a cashier if they were able to buy a soda no I'm probably more interested in knowing uh, whether they could buy a snack at the workplace if if that's uh, what they needed to do so I can find out all kinds of strengths about the person by just doing something so simple as to going uh, into 7-eleven and purchasing um, purchasing purchasing a soda after I have done my um, my discovery activity in the community. Uh, but again, I'm looking at the person from a capacity viewpoint um, and not from, uh, not from a deficit viewpoint. And so when we, um, when we're doing this, I think we need to, um, to keep uh, written documentation. What did we see? Uh, because again, we're going to look at all this rich information that we're generating on this person as we do these activities uh, to really give us um, clues about what that person wants to do. We're being a detective again, uh, if we want to look at it from that perspective. I'd like to give you just one um, one other quick um, quick example about a discovery activity, uh, focusing on not looking at it from a, a deficit view, but also not looking at it from the viewpoint of what we need to teach people before they can. Uh, become employed because that's another really important quality indicator of customized employment is that we are um, going to train the person once they become employed. We are not going to uh, train the person's skills prior to employment and we're, we're again looking at them from a capacity uh, viewpoint. Uh, this picture is uh, obviously a picture in a bookstore and uh, one of our employment specialists recently actually took someone into a bookstore because that was one of the uh, themes that seemed to be evolving from the work that she was doing with him. And so she went into um, to the bookstore and they were uh, trying to see what kinds of things he might enjoy in this particular bookstore. And I tell this story because I think it's a really interesting one in the sense that as the employment specialist was relating the story back to me, uh, she said that the task that they were looking at doing was shelving the books that needed to be reshelved after people had taken them off of the bookshelves. Now this young man, uh, she knew, was able to um, was able to read and he used a computer, but she said, but he can't um, identify uh, the name on the book to reshelve them. He doesn't know alphabetical order. Um, well, I, I immediately said, well, he doesn't really have to know alphabetical order because when we get to the point of really working with him and training him to do an activity, we can come up with all kinds of wonderful um, training strategies, compensatory strategies. Um, and if somebody said to me right now, what's the letter that comes before W? And uh, I'm not sure I could tell you without rattling off the ABCs. So, you know, it's not necessarily fair. We could, we could, one of the things that I said to her was, um, you know, could you, you uh, have a table where you put little cue cards, A, B, C, D, and then you ordered all the books that go on the A section, the B section, or the C section. Um, there are all kinds of ways that all of us know when we train people to do jobs. So when we're doing discovery, again, we're 
We're not trying to find out what the person can't do. We are trying to find out what the person can do. So the, the simplest thing that I would have done in that situation in looking at um, shelving books, well, if I quickly realized that he couldn't find the author's name on the book and I didn't have any um, tools to quickly develop a compensatory strategy for the individual, I might simply see if I directed the individual to shelve the book in the appropriate place, whether he enjoyed doing this activity. So we're looking at interests. We're not really necessarily trying to rule the person out as not being able to work in that environment because at this particular point in time, they can't do part of, of the activity. So as usual, I've been very long-winded and I have a few more things that I need to say before we end today. Um, really within the context of, of what I've already alluded to is uh, I've spent a lot of time talking about uh, observing the person, developing rich information around the person, developing themes around the person. Excuse me, once we look at the individual, we must go out and do similar things within the community as far as informational interviewing with employers. And we can't just assume that we know what goes on in business. And this is really key. Um, one of the people that I'd like to reference around the whole concept of talking with employers is D Denise Bissonette. She did a lot of wonderful work about interviewing employers and asking questions about what doesn't get done in workplaces and what are you paying overtime for? And all of these wonderful questions that we can use with employers as we uh, learn about their businesses. And where do we find these businesses? Well, we have to go back to networking with the people's, um, with the people that we are supporting in their networks and our own networks and our colleagues' networks. Um, and to really dig deep and to, to look to the community as to where people work that are interested in the same kinds of things that the people that we are supporting are interested are interested in doing. Um, and all of those things are really, uh, really critical and key. I'd like to um, to show just for a second, actually it's not a second, I believe this is about three minutes long, uh, and this is Nancy Brooks Lane uh, interviewing Audrey at um, one of the job sites that we have actually placed someone into a customized job. And she's demonstrating how to have a conversation with an employer about things that need to be done in the business. Now this whole interview lasts for 25 minutes and we're going to um, to put the link to this interview with the, with the webcast on that page so you can watch that at your leisure. I'm not going to make you watch all 25 minutes of it right now. But I would like for you to just watch about three minutes of it um, at this point and, and sort of listen to, um, to how Nancy interacts Well, um, I love your website. It's, it's not only beautiful like your <laughs> studio, but it's so informative. Um, is that something that's done with in-house or do you outsource that? I outsource it. I use Rocket Pop uh, Media to do that. And uh, as a matter of fact, they're working on the website now. They're going to make it a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they uh, don't have far to go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other piece, the blog, which is so informative too, is that, is the blog done <coughs> internally by the staff who work for you? Yes. Okay. And um, sometimes I know organizations can get so busy that that sometimes creating the blog can can kind of be one of the lower priorities. It is. is that here? Is that yes? An issue? I mean, it's something that would be very time consuming for me. Um, and you get as a business owner, you are putting out fires a lot. You're trying, yeah, you're bouncing yes. around and you're like a little flea that is <laughs> <laughs> spending a little bit of effort in each, yes. um, each category. And I feel like um, some of the things like that, like a blog, kind of takes the back burner because um, you need to focus on the things that are 
needing yeah, now. Yeah, they're emergent. Um, yeah. As and you're moving through your work with your customers. Yes, yes. and as a, an instructor also, I'm constantly trying to come up with new routines too. So, um, you know, some things will um, be more of a priority. If there was someone who was well suited to uh, the vision and mission, and I want to get a, back to that a little bit, um, and had a vocational theme of fitness in this creative way of thinking about really lifestyle, could that might be an area you could benefit from having some help with? Absolutely, yes. Okay, okay, <laughs> great. Um, and that that is uh, one of those universal areas that so many businesses, you know, when you're, you're the business owner and you have those expert skills mm -hmm. for what the vision purpose, I mean, what the business purpose is. Right. Um, if someone else who doesn't have your skills can come in um, because they're well matched to the theme of your business as well as writing, mm -hmm. that can free you up then to put all your creativity into other areas. Right, yeah. Okay, so I hope you uh, just got a little sample of how uh, Nancy was doing a great informational interview uh, with, this, uh, with this employer. Again, important, uh, important around all those things we talked about earlier, about interviewing, about talking with people, about showing interest in what they do. Uh, that's how we're going to uncover all of these um, opportunities for for people uh, to have uh, employment and to have jobs. Uh, again, I'd like to thank Nancy Brooks Lane for doing that informational interview uh, for us. Uh, take a look at it when you've got a few minutes. It's really interesting. Um, we're very lucky to partner with uh, Griffin Hammes and the Center for Social Capital on this research. Uh, that we're doing on customized employment. So after that little uh, plug for the research study that we're doing, um, I think I'd like to close with some comments about um, looking at the information that we have, uh, that we've gathered, that we look at our notes, that we look uh, what we've done as far as um, any pictures that we've taken, any videos of the person that we might be able to um, learn information from. And, and we're actually, uh, as, we, as we say, both in customized employment and in qualitative research, we are looking for emerging uh, themes that we see threaded through all of this information that we have been um, had that we have been collecting on the person and, and that it leads uh, to opportunities uh, in the community. And so I'll kind of close with this uh, little graphic that I went back to um, the beginning where I compared customized employment to a funnel and we put all of our information uh, into this funnel and we come out with some in, uh, employment themes. We develop a plan that's going to help us um, move forward uh, to assist the person in, um, in finding a job through job development, job negotiation. Um, and I thank you so much for joining me uh, for this little journey that we've been on for the last bit of time. Uh, I hope that you might have heard something that stimulated some thought for you today uh, or some ideas uh, that you have already been doing that you might uh, get some further thoughts or maybe uh, confirm that uh, you were doing uh, things in the right way or some things that you may need you may need to change. So thanks again uh, for joining to me today. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy uh, to answer them. Have a good afternoon or evening.